Good morning, gentlemen. Today's lecture is titled Naval Campaigns of the Nigerian Civil War, The Bonnie Landing. My name is Ade Inka Makinde. I am a visiting lecturer in law at the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom. One of my research interests is concerned with military history. And as you can see, one of the prime motivations of why I have an interest in the history of the Nigerian Navy is that my father, the late Captain Emmanuel Mackinde, served as a naval officer between 1964 and 1982. And what I propose to do over the next one hour and a quarter is to present an account of the preparation and execution of the amphibious assault on Boni in July 1967 during the Nigerian Civil War. And in doing so, you will cover the relevant learning outcomes pertaining to module five of the Naval Warfare course on which you are currently embarked. That is the package on Naval history. So what are our objectives? Well, in a broad sense, it would be, it will be an endeavor in elucidating on the anatomy of an amphibious operation and explaining the wider implications of the operation in terms of the military and political objectives envisaged by the federal government of Nigeria. Specifically, I will take you through the planning considerations of what was designated as Naval Operation Order Number no. 1 of 1967. Amphibious landings are inherently risky endeavors with the threat of the attacker sustaining a high level of loss of life if an enemy is dug into prepared positions. Therefore, the planning of the Bonnie landing included an assessment of enemy strength on the ground. It also considered the range of military and civilian vessels available to the Nigerian Navy, as well as the firepower which would need to be brought to bear on the enemy from the sea and in support of advancing federal troops. I will take you through the carefully choreographed movement of vessels from the naval base in Apapa to the mouth of the Boni River from where they moved into the area of operations and then performed specific functions during the landing operation. I will explore the key factors which affect landing operations. As we will find out, Boni was one of several potential landing points to be considered by the Nigerian Navy, and its selection was tied to a variety of factors, such as the access to suitable sites to beach the vessels, the physical terrain, tidal information, achieving the element of surprise, the concentration of enemy forces, and so on. In explaining and assessing these objectives, I will refer to previous amphibious landings. Incidentally, the largest and indeed the most famous of all landings, namely that which occurred on the beaches of Normandy in June of 1944, had one participant who, as fate would have it, was a serving officer in the Nigerian Navy at the time of the national crisis. His name was James Raw. Raw, incidentally, was the first person, Nigerian or British, to sign up for the envisaged Nigerian Naval Force back in the mid-1950s. More on him later. I will be also identifying the roles played by the relevant commanding officers of the ships involved. Among them were two future chiefs of naval staff, Captain Nelson Soro, commander of NNS Nigeria, and Lieutenant Commander Aki Aduo, who commanded NNS Ogoja. By the end of the lecture, I will have identified the significant contribution made by the Nigerian Navy to the effort in defeating secessionist forces and reuniting the country. It will also, I hope, stimulate you all into drawing lessons for the conduct of future amphibious operations undertaken by the Navy. Just a brief note, I will be referring to relevant naval and other military personnel by the ranks which they held at the time of the operation. Also, most of the photo images I will be displaying were taken at the time or near the time of the operation. Most of them I was thankfully able to obtain from the private archive of Captain James Raw, 
who was a commander at the time. Now this slide outlines the chronology of the lecture. Most of the time will be devoted to the preparation of the attack and its actual implementation, but note will be made of the remarkably rapid transformation of the Navy into a state of military preparedness. While it evaded the violent divisions which had ripped through the army, the Nigerian Navy endured episodes of sabotage and defection, which left the leader of the secessionist region firmly convinced that its capacities had been effectively neutralized to the extent that it was not expected to play a prominent role in the overall effort of the federal government in attempting to crush the rebellion. I will end the lecture by summing up the effect of all the successfully executed seaball landings, which were undertaken between 1967 and 1968. They were vitally important in putting into motion the eventual encirclement and defeat of the secessionist forces. Now, during these upheavals caused by divisions in the army, the Navy remained a stable organization under the leadership of Commodore Joseph Way. On the way, the Navy participated in the efforts aimed at stabilizing the country and providing legitimacy to the two military governments which were formed in 1966. Commodore Way also attended the peace talks held under the auspices of the Ghanaian government in the town of Aburi in January 1967. Now, this slide has a pen portrait of Commodore Way, who had been serving as the first indigenous chief of naval staff since 1964. He was a marine engineer by background. As CNS, he would go on to supervise and approve the naval operations that involved the seaborne landings, as well as the instituting of a blockade against the secessionist state of Biafra. Now, during this period, the Nigerian Navy was also facing its own challenges. Personnel from all regions continued to serve side by side, but there was an unavoidable uneasiness given the prevailing circumstances in the country. The drift towards an internal war and the fear that naval force would be used if such a war, if it was waged against the eastern region, led to acts of sabotage. In April 1967, the base was plunged into darkness by a power cut. This was followed by the vandalizing of electronic equipment on board many of the Navy's vessels. These included navigational aids and communication apparatus. Armaments, gunfire pins and engine parts were either totally removed or disabled. In the meantime, there were defections of officers and men to the eastern region before its secession on May 30th, 1967. Now the build up to the first amphibious landing was preceded by important military tasks which were undertaken by the Navy. Prior to the declaration by the federal government of a police action, on July 6, 1967, the promulgation of the Territorial Waters Decree, number 5 of 1967, which extended the limit of Nigeria's territorial sea from the customary 3 nautical miles to 12 nautical miles, paved the way for the Navy to mount an economic blockade against the seceded eastern region. The objective was to blockade the littoral space where oil was exported the prime targets being the harbours in Port Harcourt and Boni. The strategic dimension of this blockade was to prevent arms being smuggled into the secessionist state, and the economic dimension related to stopping international trade with the former eastern region. The next step was to mount an amphibious landing of federal troops, a move that would be orchestrated by the Nigerian Navy. The newly promoted Rear Admiral Way was handed a list of possible sites by Major General Yakubu Gawan, the head of the federal military government. I will go into the options given to the Navy, but before this, I would like to examine the concept of the amphibious operation. The authors Ian Speller and Christopher Tuck define amphibious warfare as follows. 
a type of offensive military operation that today uses naval ships to project la ground and air power onto a hostile or potentially hostile shore at a designated landing beach. Now, in July 1967, the Nigerian Armed Forces were not able to project air power in its first landing. However, the Air Force was able to provide this by the time the penultimate and final landings were, take, were undertaken, respectively, at Calabar and Oro. Amphibious operations are traditionally classified into four types, namely the amphibious assault, amphibious withdrawal, amphibious demonstration, and an amphibious raid. A fifth, namely that of amphibious support, is often added these days. The operation of Boni was designed and executed as an amphibious assault. It was not an exploratory exercise solely intended to inflict damage on the enemy, collect information, or otherwise create a diversion. That is a raid. Neither was the idea of demonstration involved. You know, the Boni operation was not a deception designed to divert attention from other landing sites, nor was it a peacetime exercise with the objective of impressing a potential adversary. It was also not a withdrawal, which is an operation designed to extract forces from a hostile shore. And it certainly was not a mission designed to offer support on the basis of providing humanitarian or disaster relief. The idea behind the Boni operation was for a Nigerian Naval Task Force to transport, land and establish soldiers of the newly created 3rd Infantry Division onto territory held by secessionist forces and begin the effort of regaining territory. Now, the starting point for any exploration of how the Boni landing was conceptualized and put into effect must be with the figure of Commander James Raw who at the time of the crisis was serving as principal staff officer and commander of the naval base in Apapa. Raw was a veteran of the Second World War and was still a teenage midshipman of the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve when, as a navigation officer of a landing craft, he landed the first wave of American troops on Utah Beach. As the only officer serving in the Nigerian Navy who had faced gunfire while landing on a beach, it was obvious that his knowledge and experience would be central to the planning and execution of the forthcoming operation. The other handy bit of experience brought to the table by Raw was that of his role as a hydrographer. His long-term experience of surveying the coastline of Nigeria, including the rivers and creeks of the Niger Delta, would be crucial because, quite frankly, he knew the coastal area better than any of his navigator colleagues. And so he became the author of what would be known as Naval Operation Order No. 1 of 1967 and the subsequent operational orders. Also, in conjunction with Rear Admiral Way, he formulated an overall naval strategy. Raw went on to produce a paper which would cover three things. First, he outlined some general points related to the nature of seaborne operations. Secondly, he scrutinized the viability of three potential landing sites prior to offering a justification of his choice as the most suitable one. And finally, he assessed the capacities of the naval and merchant vessels which would be available to carry out a landing. Now, before proceeding with a summary of Raw's paper, it is important to emphasize the point that Nigeria was a young nation which had not developed any substantive naval traditions in the modern sense. It did not have what one might describe as a military intellectual complex from which to draw from decades or even centuries of tried and tested naval operational concepts. The Nigerian Navy had its small but increasing naval warfare personnel trained at foreign institutions, most notably at the Britannia Naval College in Dartmouth, England but it lacked relevant indigenous institutions, including that of a naval war college and specialist departments in higher education organizations, where the built up intellectual resources of naval and civilian thinkers composed of analysts and strategists 
would have laid down the theoretical foundations of Nigerian sea power. And even though it could be argued that national military doctrines would be focused on combating external threats rather than an internal war, the fact remained that the Nigerian Navy had no experience whatsoever in planning and implementing a seaborne landing operation. Although the possibility had existed in the past of Inter-service uh, of an inter-service operation, one over political tensions with ta uh, Cameroon, and another related uh, to plan a planned invasion of Togo to aid President Silvanus Olympio in the event of a war with Nkrumahist Ghana, the Nigerian Navy and Nigerian Army had never performed a combined operation. Apart from its deficiency in the aforementioned military intellectual complex. The Nigerian Navy did not have an indigenous military industrial complex from which it produced its own weapons, including naval ships. This was a crucial matter indirectly addressed by Commander Raw, who noted that if the Navy's only landing craft were to be damaged during an operation, there would be no landing. The reliance on foreign manufacturers was also a problem, given the widespread acts of sabotage on most of the Navy's ships committed in April of 1967. The first segment of the top secret paper produced by Commander Raw, which was titled General Information and Remarks on Landings, outlined the necessity of having intelligence on the physical terrain of the proposed landing site and the resistance that was likely to be met. Among other considerations, he emphasized the absolute necessity of degrading any prepared enemy positions and examined the methods which would be employed in the battlefield. The weaponry and manpower available to both adversaries uh, was also considered. Finally, he looked at failures in a select number of amphibious operations undertaken by combined forces during the Second World War. Looking at his observations and assessments 56 years later, it's worth bearing in mind the words of Professor Yoshi Yoshihara, a contemporary expert in the field of maritime strategy, who said that while technologies change, the logic remains the same. And one constant and inexorably logical mm -hmm. attendant to the preparation of an amphibious assault is the gathering of intelligence data. The Nigerian Navy, alongside the army, needed in the first instance to gather clear and reliable intelligence on the physical geography of the area, which would eventually function as a landing site, as well as on the concentrations of enemy forces in the vicinity of the targeted area. So far as physical geography is concerned, one vital piece of information commanders need to be fully informed of should be the nature of the beach. From this, they will be able to assess whether vehicles will be able to move over it, as well as the chances of the landing craft being damaged. Factors to be taken into account include the gradient of the beach and any natural and man-made obstructions on such a beach. Knowledge of the gradient of the beach allows commanders to assess the depth of water through which men and vehicles would have to wade through before reaching the shore. Regarding potential obstructions, you will appreciate that the presence of a seawall or steep rise in land would be an encumbrance to landing equipment and enabling troops to break out from the beach. Of particular concern to the Naval Command, Commander Rowe noted, the importance of having knowledge of the tidal stream and the amount of rise and fall of tide. This would then determine the angle of approach which the landing craft would make to the beach and the length of time the craft would be able to remain on the beach without being stranded. Another issue of concern to the Navy would be the sea conditions. In other words, they needed to have an idea of the level of surf or volatility of waves once the landing craft had beached. The second major issue, namely that of dealing with enemy concentrations around the designated area of beaching, was of particular concern to Commander Raw, who stressed the need for enemy positions to be sufficiently weakened by initial bombardment. In the case of a first landing, the Nigerian Navy would have to accomplish this without the assistance of an Air Force. 
The Navy would, of course, be responsible for getting troops of the 3rd Infantry Division onto land. The best method to begin the enterprise would be to first send a small craft, carrying few men and offering small targets. Once the beach is made secure, the larger landing craft would be brought in to build up the landing force. The Navy would be intimately involved in the method of supplying the force once it is landed and facilitating the transporting of vehicles, stores and equipment from the point at which the craft beaches to firm land. Commander Raw's paper assessed the relative strengths of both federal and secessionist forces and noted that while the enemy was limited in terms of the weaponry it could bring to the arena of battle, the Nigerian forces were also limited. For one, the Navy did not possess any small landing craft. Dinghies would provide a substitute of sorts, and it only possessed one landing craft tank. The stakes were high, for as Commander Raw noted, if Nigeria's sole landing craft were damaged before landing the first wave of troops, there would be no landing. Furthermore, if the landing craft was damaged after landing the first troops, but before a jetty was captured, where ordinary vessels could berth, then the troops on shore would be unable to be reinforced or be supplied with additional stores. Commander Raw was able to offer practical insight into the question of landing, given his experiences during World War II, offering three painful lessons the Allied forces endured. In so far as the prior knowledge of physical geography of the selected landing site was concerned, he offered the examples of the amphibious operations conducted at Dieppe in 1942 and at Omaha Beach in 1944. Dieppe, an operation which incidentally was overseen by Admiral Louis Mountbatten, failed because no account had been taken during the planning of the seawall which prevented tanks and vehicles from leaving the beach. The element of surprise was thus lost. In the case of the landing at Omaha Beach, American forces found themselves unable to break out from the beach area because the terrain behind the beach consisted of steep cliffs. The failure of the amphibious raid at Dieppe and the near failure of the landing at Omaha Beach were also due to the failure to degrade enemy positions by bombardment. This was also at the heart of the costly loss of life among Royal Navy personnel during the operation to capture the Belgian region of Walcheren, which controls access to the seaport of Antwerp. Sorties carried out by the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy bombardment did not successfully neutralize several potent German batteries, one of which scored a direct hit on a landing craft which killed around 300 Allied personnel. The incident had a profound effect on the young James Raw, who knew many of the naval officers who took part in the operation and several friends of his died. Although he did not participate in the operation as he had in Normandy, he learned lessons from the mistakes made by the operation commanders, one, was, one of which was relying too much on the element of surprise. We now go on to the question of selecting the location for the first amphibious assault conducted by the Nigerian Navy during the Civil War. As I mentioned earlier, the head of state had given the Naval Command a list of possible landing sites. Among them were Port Harcourt, Opobo, and Boni. Port Harcourt was strategically an important town which featured high on the list of possible candidates. Its harbour facilities, as well as its connection with Nigeria's then burgeon in oil production, marked it out. It was of critical importance that it come under federal control as soon as possible to prevent the secessionist state from conducting a lucrative international trade which would be you know, which would economically empower it and therefore enable it to build up a more formidable arsenal. But Potakot was over 40 miles up from the Boni Fairway Boy. It would take between four to six hours to get there, depending on the part on the tide, after entering the Boni River. The task force would surely be sighted, 
which would give the enemy plenty of opportunity to prepare defensive positions. Moreover, the approach to Potarkot for the last 20 miles becomes narrow, which would enable the opposition, if armed with mortars or rocket-propelled short-range weapons, to inflict heavy damage on the convoy. Even if the naval force successfully beached, the civil vessel, the civilian vessels would make for large, easy targets, and the supply chain of ships would have to take enormous risks during the 40-mile journey until the banks of the Bunny River were cleared of the enemy. From a naval point of view, concluded Commander Raw, to embark on an attack on Potapo direct would invite disaster. Opobo ostensibly presented a more promising location. There were suitable locations to beach and there was sufficient depth of water to enable ve vessels to maneuver once vessels passed the river bar. However, there were difficulties, the most critical of which was the river, the river bar. There was great uncertainty about the depth of the waters in this area. The river was not used commercially and the last survey had been conducted in 1961. The lack of water on the bar would mean that only the landing craft would be able to enter the river and that the landing would have to take place without naval fire support. Adding to the potential problems was the question of weather conditions. River bars are vulnerable to the effects of heavy rain, fierce winds and crashing waves. If the weather was bad in the Apobo area, it would mean that even the Navy's landing craft would most likely be unable to enter the river. It would be too much to risk the only landing craft ending up stranded on one of the sand spits on either side of the river channel. Still another impediment was the lack of intelligence on the presence and visibility of marker buoys and a beacon, that is a lighthouse. The marker buoys would of course enable the task force to negotiate the navigable areas of the river, while the beacon would aid the ships in fixing their positions prior to entering the river. The elimination of Potakot and Opobo left Boni as the only site where, from a naval point of view, as Commander Raw put it, a landing would have a fair chance of success. It ticked most of the boxes. The water was deep all the way up to the town. The wideness of the river would give ships room for manoeuvre. There were several spots which were suitable for the landing craft to beach. There were jetties at which ships could berth and supply stores, even if the landing craft was disabled. Enemy vessels would be able to provide, uh, make a pardon, naval vessels would be able to provide fire support to the troops being landed. And enemy vessels intended, intending to bring reinforcements down the river would be intercepted. Additionally, Occupying Boni would seal off Potarkot 40 miles up the river and landing on an island would make it uh, and taking it had the added advantage of an island being easier to defend than an area of mainland. So as this slide shows, a successful landing and capture of Boni would yield great benefits for the federal war, uh, federal war effort. Firstly, it would release the Navy from blockade duty off Bonny River and allow it to concentrate on other areas. Secondly, the Navy would have an area close to the base of operations and would be in a better position to support the Army. Uh, thirdly, military forces could be built for an advance onto Potar Port. Uh, there was also the obvious political and economic importance of capturing Bonny Town and the adjacent oil terminal. At the time, Shell BP was still mulling over whether to pay the secessionist state royalties when its chairman was arrested by secessionist troops while he was on a visit to Potakot. Capturing Boni would make it quite clear to Shell BP that it was federal Nigeria which would control the export of oil. The third and final section of uh, Commander Raw's paper set out the vessels which were available to serve in the task force. It's important to remind you of my previous statement regarding Nigeria's not having a military industrial complex, the result of its not having developed an industrial base as a country. 
None of the vessels, naval or merchant, had been built in Nigeria. This, of course, leads to issues pertaining to the dangers associated with over-reliance on foreign suppliers, as well as the costs associated with maintenance. It was an issue still exercising Nigerian naval personnel decades later when Captain O.A. Oladi Jeji wrote a piece for the U.S. Naval Institute in 1990 titled, Where Are African Navies Going? At the start of the Civil War, the Nigerian Navy owned ships which had once been in the service of the navies of the United States or Western European countries such as Britain, the Netherlands, Germany and France. <clears throat> Still, the Navy had more vessels at its disposal than the secessionist side, which had acquired NNS Ibanon, a minesweeper which had been on patrol off the eastern region during the crisis. Arraigned against that sole vessel would be a frigate, a patrol boat, which was a corvette, three seaward defence boats, and one landing craft. Merchant ships would also be available to serve as troop carriers and to transport stores. So let's go through each ship to gauge their respective physical features and the firepower which they would bring to the theatre of war. In NS Nigeria, a Dutch-made frigate was 314 feet in length and had a maximum speed of 24 knots. It had one set of twin MK-16 high-angle, low-angle naval guns, which were quick-firing and used by the Royal Navy and other Commonwealth navies. It also had four buffers anti-aircraft guns. NNS Ogoja was an 185-foot-long corvette, armed with a 3-inch gun, four 40mm Bofors guns and six 20mm Ehrlichens. It was fitted with anti-submarine warfare equipment and had a maximum speed of 18 knots. The Nigerian Navy also had three seaward defence boats, namely NNS Enugu, NNS Benin and NNS Kaduna, all 110 foot long and armed with 140 millimetre buffers and anti-submarine equipment. Each had a speed of 13 knots. The landing craft NNS Lokoja was 188 foot in length and had two 20 millimeter early guns. It had a speed of eight knots. NNS Penelope was a 79 foot long survey vessel, which was converted into an arm ship, possessing a one 20 millimeter early gun and two Vickers machine guns. The naval uh, vessels would be accompanied by two merchant ships named MV Bode Thomas and the MV King Jaja. This slide shows a photograph of NNS Nigeria soon after its commissioning in 1965. After considering all the issues of the three sections, it was up to the high command of the Nigerian armed forces to determine whether the information and assessment were such that the military necessity of the landings outweighed the risks involved. The decision to stage the landing in Boni was soon confirmed and Commander Raw drew up a mission plan which specified the role to be played by the commanding officer of each ship from the moment they were issued with sailing orders to the landing operation. Command responsibilities were clearly delineated and issues such as communication procedures, logistics, medical and tidal information were dealt with. Preamble to Naval Operation Order No. 1, 1967, is straightforward, as you can see from the slide. Uh, the situation was that Bonnie Town was occupied by enemy forces uh, who were approximately 300 strong and in prepared positions. And the mission was to transport land and afford the support of naval firepower to federal troops in order to facilitate the capture of Bonnie Town and the island on which it was situated. This is the command structure. The three senior most commanders of the mission were identified as Captain Nelson Sora, 
who was designated as the officer in charge of the operation, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Adekule, the General Officer commanding the 3rd Infantry Division, was the officer commanding land forces, and Commander James Raw was given the role of Naval Liaison Officer and Forward Control Officer. This is a pen portrait of Captain Sorrow, the officer in charge of the mission. Like way, he was transferred from the Marine Department to the Royal Nigerian Navy, where he became a pioneer naval warfare officer. He commanded several ships, including NNS Nigeria, and was earmarked as the eventual successor to Rear Admiral Way as the Chief of Naval Staff. The plan provided for the task force to land troops in three waves. The first wave would consist of troops on the landing craft NNS Lokoja, which would beach on the northern part of Boni Town. The second wave would be landed by NNS Nigeria when the situation permitted, and then the third wave would, would be landed after Boni Town was captured. Now, the timeline <coughs> regarding the commanding of the operation was that during the seaborne assault, the officer in charge of the mission, namely Captain Soro, the commanding officer of NNS Nigeria, would exercise control through the forward control officer, Commander Ro, the commanding officer of NNS Penelope. Ro would lead the task force into battle, while NNS Nigeria, a prized asset, which the Navy could not place in unnecessary risk in shallower and more confined waters, would bombard enemy placements within Boni. After completing the landing operations, sea and land commands would then divide. This slide shows the vessels taking part in their and their commanding officers. Uh, note that although Lieutenant Commander Adegbite had been scheduled to command NNS Benin, one of the SDBs, his place was apparently later taken over by Lieutenant Promise Fingesi. The movement of vessels was also carefully choreographed for the, fur, for the three different stages of the operation. First was the initial movement of vessels. Second was the movement of vessels to the area of operations, and third was the function of the vessels during the landing operation. Now, the initial movement of vessels from the naval base in Lagos had to be staggered as each of the types of ships had different capacities of speed. NNS Lokoja sail, sailing at a speed of eight knots was scheduled to leave first, it was destined for Escravos, but would rendezvous first with MV Bode Thomas, a ship of the Nigerian Ports Authority at Ogidibe, and then embark the assault troops. After this, it would sail to meet the main body of the task force at Escravos Fairway Boy. Penelope sailed after Lokoja, moving at self not, uh, seven knots, and it headed directly to Boni Fairway Boy. Then Nigeria, alongside Ogoja, Enugu and Benin, uh, was scheduled to leave very shortly after Penelope at a speed of 12 knots, and it was scheduled to rendezvous with Lokoja at Escravos Fairway Boy. And then from Escravos, all ships would produce, uh, will proceed to rendezvous with Penelope at Bonny Fairway Boy. Now, after the ships assembled on the Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the Boni River, the movement of vessels into the area of operations would begin. As is the tradition in military planning, a segment beginning from the Atlantic Ocean up to the waters of the Boni River that is adjacent to Boni Island was divided into several, uh, separate named areas. From south to north, the areas were named Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victor, Whiskey, X-Ray, Yankee, and Zulu. Correspondingly, at the same time, Bonnie Town was divided into several sectors in which the ship commanders were assigned tasks related to shore bombardment and providing covering fire for troops once they 
got ashore. From south to north, the sectors were Mike, the Shell area, India, Hotel, Gulf, Foxtrot, Echo, Delta, Bravo, and Alpha. Here you can see the different zones in a map which I based on the overlay to Admiralty chart created by Commander Raw. NNS Ogoja under Lieutenant Commander Aduo was scheduled to move northwards into Area Sierra, while NNS Enugu and NNS Benin to be commanded respectively by Lieutenant Commander Abdullahi and Lieutenant Commander Adigbite would advance further into Area Tango. Then the landing craft, NNS Lokaja, commanded by Commander Joe, and then escorted by NNS Benin, would proceed into the next zone, designated as Area Uniform. NNS Penelope would operate flexibly, with Commander Raw communicating orders to the ships and simultaneously apprising NNS Nigeria of the combat situation, while Nigeria remained in the southernmost areas in the Atlantic Ocean, respectively named Area Papa and Area Oscar. NNS Niger would use its large guns to bombard enemy positions, with bombardment being supplemented by those ships carrying Buffer's guns. Ehrlichan guns and Vickers guns could be used to provide covering fire for advancing Federal troops. Let me embark on a more forensic look at the role of each vessel. Captain Sorrow in NNS Nigeria was to remain in either the Papa or Oscar areas until it was safe for her to enter into the Bonnie River. It is of course important to assess your vulnerabilities and NNS Nigeria was a case in point. There's a saying that you don't risk your big ships as you will not get an equivalent amount of military value from it. Ships have always been vulnerable in a multiplicity of ways. The sinking of HMS Repulse and HMS Prince of Wales by Japanese land-based aircraft in 1941 was the first time that capital ships were sunk solely by air power while actively defending themselves. It ended the era of battleships. And just three months after the landing at Boni, AINS Ailat, an Israeli Z-class uh, destroyer, which was formerly the Royal Navy's HMS Zealous, was sunk by an Egyptian coma class missile boat positioned within the harbour at Port Said during the Israeli-Egyptian War of Attrition. Thus, Nigeria, NNS Nigeria would not be put at risk to ensure that it provided effective support to the land forces. Nigeria's role at the commencement of the operation was to silence any artillery or gun positions in the theatre of war waiting for an appropriate moment later to enter the battle zone after the first wave of troops was landed by NNS Lokoja. Captain Soro had on board 10 assault boats and it would be up to him to decide whether to use them to disembark the troops who were on board Nigeria or to transfer them to Commander Joe on Lokoja, which was supposed to rejoin Nigeria after it disembarked the first wave. While <coughs> operations were ongoing, war flares or star shells were to be used as a means of conveying military signals. So Lieutenant Commander Abdullahi on NNS Enugu was expected to communicate with the SDBs, uh, was expected to communicate when the SDBs opened fire to Captain Soro by sending up one green very light. Commander Raw, the forward control officer on Penelope, was to back this up verbally via radio channel. Lieutenant Commander Adu on NNS Ogoja was to remain within Area Sierra to provide bombardment and cover fire in Sector Gulf in Boni. Ogoja's task was to engage enemy troops and prevent them from moving north where the landing was taking place. It was also expected to engage any enemy troops if they retreated southwards. In order to avoid casualties caused by friendly fire, Adul and other ship commanders were advised of the procedure associated with indicating the position of friendly troops. The troops of the 3rd Division engaging the enemy in Boni 
were expected to indicate their position to naval vessels by firing one green very light. In doing so, the troops uh, would be indicating their most southerly position, which would permit relevant naval vessels to fire ahead of them. This is because the commanding officers on the vessels would presume that the troops to the north of the point from where the very light was fired were friendly and those to the south were enemy troops unless the vessel relevant vessel commander had strong reason to believe otherwise. In area Tango, Lieutenant Commander Abdullahi and uh, Lieutenant Commander Adibite respectively on NNS Enugu and NNS Benin were tasked first with firing at the jetties situated at the northern end of Boni, after which they would bombard the landing area situated between the two northernmost jetties. Abdullahi was charged with arranging the bombardment so that the whole target area was covered between Enugu and Benin. Both commanding officers were under instructions not to fire from north of their position in Tango unless necessary in order to prevent stray shells from landing in the high density part of Bonny Town designated as Sector, Sector Foxtrot. Abdullahi had the responsibility for firing one green very light when firing commenced and both he and Adibite were to cease firing on the landing area once Joe in Lokoja fired one red very light. Once Enugu and Benin completed their bombardment, they were to move north into the next zone, area uniform, where they were expected to engage any enemy vessels or enemy aircraft coming down the Boni River. Lokoja was expected to land between the two northernmost jetties of Boni Town with the exact position of the landing to be decided by Commander Joe. Joe was, as mentioned uh, earlier on, expected to fire one red very light in the La in the final stage of her beach in run. Throughout all of this, Commander Raw in Penelope would act as the forward control for both sea and land forces until Captain Soro entered the Boni River in NNS, Nigeria. Now, to round off our look at the operation order, I'll make a brief mention of miscellaneous matters. In his battle plan, Commander Raw reminded all commanding officers that their ships were to be prepared to defend themselves against air attack and to post lookouts to give warning of approaching aircraft. They were expected to engage with any enemy in their vicinity, and where this was not the case, they were to forward pertinent information to control, that is, Commander Raw's ship. Voice traffic was to be kept to a minimum, and ship captains were reminded not to fire into the high-density sector, sector Foxtrot unless essential. Logistics covered supplies of ammunition, fuel and food. All vessels were told to stock up on their full outfit of ammunition before sailing and to cram in as much as possible if there was enough stowage space. All vessels were to be fueled to no less than 95% of their capacities and to have enough water which would be rationed. So far as food was concerned, all vessels were to be stocked with as much fresh and dry rations as could be stowed. Vessels were instructed not to leave Lagos with less than seven days rations of food. The ships were supposed to have first aid medical supplies with access to a doctor and other medical personnel on NNS Nigeria. Those wounded who required more than the first aid would be transferred to NNS Nigeria as soon as it was expeditious. Nigeria would also be carrying additional personnel for replacement purposes. Tidal information specific to the high water and lower mark estimates regarding both Boni Bar and Boni Town was also given, which covered four periods during the day on Monday, July 24th, Tuesday, July 25th, and Wednesday, July 26th. Communications, finally, uh, Naval Order, 
number one of 1967 laid out the command and communication structure of the mission. As previously mentioned, the three key officers were Captain Sorrow, Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle and Commander Raw. Raw would be at the centre of the communication network, which on one side consisted of the ships Lokoja, Ogoja, Benin and Enugu, and on the other, Captain Soro in Nigeria, who would provide communication to naval headquarters and merchant ships. This format would endure until circumstances permitted Nigeria to enter the Boni River and take direct control of the operation. Nigeria would keep guard on circuit 201 and Captain Soro would order each of the ships to keep guard when appropriate on designated frequencies in voice and Morse code. Each ship was given a call sign. Um, NNS Nigeria was Beauty, uh, Penelope was Sparrow, Kaduna was Love and so on. All ships share the same, uh, the, the call sign, Loco. Here you can see an excerpt of the naval order depicting the command network as drawn by Commander Raw, and as I've explained in the previous slide. Now, we come to the preparations undertaken by the Nigerian Navy to accomplish the amphibious attack on Boni. This presented a challenge on many fronts. There was a logistical aspect, an intelligence aspect, as well as the aspect concerned with the effort of harmonizing two branches of the armed forces embarked on a first combined operation. All of these needed to be attained within a short period of time. As mentioned earlier, naval equipment on board vessels and on shore at the Apapa base had been vandalized by about to defect naval personnel from the eastern region. The gradual disappearance of personnel consisting of both officers and ratings who were clandestinely returning to their native region, as well as the interference with apparatus, were setbacks. The damage was so extensive so as to convince the secessionist side that the Nigerian Navy would be rendered impotent for a considerable period of time. In a conversation between the secessionist leader, Lieutenant Colonel Odumegu Ojuku and the respective Deputy High Commissioner of the United Kingdom and the United States in Enugu, Ojuku had expressed contempt when informed of both men, uh, informed by both men of the rumors of a planned federal invasion from the sea. Ojuku insisted that the Nigerian Navy was not patrolling off the coast of the former eastern region, and in a separate utterance, he warned that his forces would line the bottom of the creeks of the Niger Delta with the ships of the Nigerian Navy if they ventured close to the coast. But Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku was wrong. In his 2004 memoir, Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle noted that due to the excellent relationship between the naval personnel and their foreign suppliers, the Navy was able to replenish her stock in a very short time. The Navy also competently organized second level maintenance by well-trained technical staff. And in an intelligence triumph, the Navy and her sister service undertook to carry out their preparations under the greatest level of secrecy. I definitely recall that all non-essential civilians from Ikeja cantonment were dismissed and a regime of mail censorship and telephone tapping was imposed. While the country lacked an industrial military complex, it was able to adapt and innovate solutions for a range of issues using local resources. For instance, it was clear that the troops would need life jackets, but a question arose as to the amount of buoyancy a soldier with full kit, steel helmet and rifle would need to stay afloat. Commander Raw therefore arranged for Major Tony Ochefu to bring a soldier to the naval base in full kit. The soldier was fitted with a canvas jacket with blocks of polystyrene and a rope was tied around him before he was dropped into the ocean from a harbour. It took four drops to calibrate the required amount of buoyancy by incremental additions of polystyrene. Also, NNS Lokoja was provided with matting 
and expanded metal to cover any soft spots on the beach to help with the landing of vehicles. The Navy was also faced with the task of undertaking combat exercises as well as building up the requisite esprit de corps with their counterparts in the Army. On both accounts, the figure of Commander Rohr was influential. Rohr had been a part of combined operations during World War II and he completed the commander training course near Fort William in Scotland. Thus, his training and experiences had made him a great believer in the need for integrated operations and the need for the branches of the armed forces to work closely together and to know how the other arms operated. It was also important to Raw that the service branches trusted each other. Both Soro and Adekule wrote about the combined exercises which took place around Takwa Bay. Adekule described the naval maneuvers undertaken to have included ship pitching, embarkation and disembarkation in daylight and darkness, while Soro recalled that the army was trained in handling dinghies and outboard engines because they needed boats for moving their men into the creeks as soon as they were put ashore by the naval ships. And to solidify the sense of camaraderie between naval and army officers, a series of joint mass dinners was organized. This slide shows a photograph taken of Commander Raw and Lieutenant Colonel Adekule at the bridge of NNS Penelope, the converted survey ship commanded by Raw. Both men built up a solid relationship during the joint service operations conducted in the Nigerian Civil War. Both men formulated their battle plans for each amphibious landing and met to coordinate their plans. As Raw later recalled, they both shared danger and discomfort and had complete trust in each other when in the face of the enemy. A through thorough preparedness for battle does not totally obviate the danger of having to cope with unexpected setbacks. Indeed, as Molke the Elder, the German Field Marshal warned, no plan of operations extends with certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main strength. He believed in developing a series of options for battle instead of a single plan. Now, with its modest collection of ships, including only one landing craft, the Nigerian Naval Task Force did not have a multiplicity of options in so far as conducting the amphibious assault, or in so far as conducting the amphibious assault was concerned. But as it set sail, they would have been comforted by the fact that the enemy had far fewer men and material to oppose them. Sailing orders were given on July 22nd, 1967, and the rendezvous of all participant vessels at Bonny Boy happened without a hitch. On July 25th, the order to execute was given on the first daylight by Captain Soro, who began pounding enemy positions from Nigeria as Commander Raw led the force into Bonny River. As the ships sailed past the Bonny Oil Terminal, an expatriate manager was about to have his breakfast when his attention was drawn to the ships passing by. While he was doubtful of the ability of the, the, the secessionist side to have acquired the six grey ships, his Biafran steward felt that his leader, Lieutenant Colonel Ojukul, had made good on his promise to assemble a naval force. While this conversation was going on, Commander Raw in NNS Penelope gave the order to fire on the signal station and telegraph office to cut off Bonnie's connections to Botarcourt. Both men took cover, and when they met under the table, they agreed that it was not the Biafran Navy after all. As the flotilla proceeded, it encountered the former NNS battle, which had been rechristened BNS Ibadan. The captain of the secessionist ship, Lieutenant Commander P.J. Odu, 
recall that three ships were in the process of bombarding Boni when contact was made. Ibado was retreating into the Boni River in the direction of Portakot when Ro ordered Lieutenant Commander Adul to detach Ogoja from the convoy and give chase. Ogoja opened fire with its 3 inch and 40 millimeter guns, and Odu, in his words, with his comparatively puny Bofors anti aircraft gun, responded. But Ibadan's gun kept jamming at intervals after every third or fourth round, so Odu decided to turn his ship around whenever it jammed to keep its distance from Aduo's ship. But it eventually entered shallow waters and was unable to maneuver back to the open sea. It became a stationary target. A cannon fired from Ogoja scored a direct hit on Ibadan's engine room. It created an intense fire which melted the, la uh, the ladder deck uh, below deck, trapping the men not on deck to certain death. Above, the smoke billowed out through the funnel on the deck, which was itself littered with bodies. Surveying the wreckage from his bridge, Adua could see Odu clearly through his binoculars. He went to the megaphone to appeal to him to join him on Ogoja and was preparing to send a lifeboat to collect Odu and his surviving crew. But Odu and his men escaped into an adjoining mangrove swamp. Aduo rejoined the task force to report to Ro that an enemy vessel had been sunk, adding, I hope the captain got away, he was a friend of mine. This slide shows a photograph of the wrecked Ibadan with the words, the Biafran Navy RIP written on its side. Here we can see troops in the foreground and sailors in the background on board NNS Penelope while the battle was ongoing. And here is one of a gun crew on Penelope manning a Vickers machine gun during the attack. With the battle sunk, the bombardment of Bonny continued, with suspected enemy positions being cannonaded by uh, Nigeria, as well as Benin and Enugu. It was effective enough to disorientate and dislodge the Biafran forces stationed there, and according to Sorrow, they offered little or no resistance. Commander Joe beached Lokoja at the chosen site in the northern part of the town. According to Aduo, this had been because of the intelligence revelation of the sparse concentrations of uh, secessionist soldiers in the area. It was also den to deny Biaf the Biafran side the possibility of being reinforced from Harcourt. Ro and Adekule found a small jetty and disembarked with 40 troops to minor resistance. The other ships, which all carried a quota of troops, also found jetties at which they disembarked. Bonnie was captured within two hours of the first salvo of cannon fired by the Nigerian warships. Resistance was roughly what had been expected. There were around 200 casualties, most of whom were secessionist soldiers. Unable to contact Sorrow by radio, Law made his way down the estuary to inform him that all was safe to enter the estuary with the merchant ships. There had been some mishaps which the opposition had been unable to exploit. For instance, Lokoja and Benin ran aground at different points during the operation. Lokoja, while attempting to land a second batch of troops, and could not get out until high tide, while Benin suffered the same fate on the same day of the on the second day of the operation. These incidents would have been disastrous if the enemy had more formidable resources to have exploited them. That is NNS uh, Lokoja landing troops on D-Day in Boni. And here Commander Raw poses with crew of Penelope after the capture of Boni Town. 
So the landing executed by the Navy and aided by naval firepower led to the capture of neighboring Peterside and the advanced position of Dawes Island, 20 miles north of Bonny. The ocean oil terminal on Bonny was captured intact. And although Commander Raw and his crew did reach uh, Port Harcourt oil refinery, they carried too few troops to permanently occupy the deserted complex. Nonetheless, the operation was a success. And after two weeks, the Navy could claim a successful landing and degrading of the enemy's manpower and resources. Over 100 prisoners were taken to the naval base in Apapa, and the Navy acquired material and equipment salvaged from the wreck of Ibadan. So this shows Com Commander Raw and some of his crew working to detach the Beaufort's 40 millimeter gun from Ibadan. And so the Navy and Army pro proved that they could work together and achieve set objectives. Uh, the relationship between the Naval Liaison Officer, Commander Raw, and Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle developed into a close and fruitful one, as this undated note from Adekunle indicates. Uh, Bonnie, dear Jim, the unit commander of the troops at Dawes Island, saw me at 1 a.m. to report that it will be essential to locate a ship at the island, even if it is for 24 hours. The reasons are, one, to scare away the helicopters, two, to revive the low morale of the troops there. I do endorse the plea and would graciously request you send one of your SDBs for 24 hours only. Without being overbearing, may I suggest Ogoja? Thank you for your cooperation. Benji. And so the Navy and Army, uh, <coughs> um, their accomplishment was um, uh, noted by the uh, Army High Command. And uh, on receiving the news that Bonny had been captured, the head of state, Major General Yakubu Gawan, sent the following message of commendation to the officer in charge of the operation, Captain Soro. It read, you have got all the right to feel happy proud and contented with the result of the recent combined operations at Boni, which was your responsibility to see come off successfully. The Army commander has sent me a signal saying how nobly well the Navy did in the, in the conveying, landing and support fire role which the Navy gave to the Army at the operations in Boni. Now, yet the, the achievement of Boni came perilously close to being undone in late September 1967 when the secessionist side launched Operation Sea Jack, a determined attempt to retake the town. There were several reasons why the enemy had been emboldened to make this attack. Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle claimed, not without reason, that the Navy had not been making aggressive patrols of the Bonny River and at one point he sent Captain Sorrow an irate signal which asserted that if Sorrow was not prepared to order aggressive patrols of the Bonny River that he had better go back to Lagos as naval ships were not supposed to adorn the area for their good looks only. Adugli felt that this lack of aggression had given the secessionist side the temerity to occasionally send boats down the Bonny River uh, to shell Bonny Town. But the fault did not reside only with the Navy. The rapid expansion of the Nigerian army had meant that there was a problem of finding senior officers to command battalions. This was compounded by the fact that the 3rd Infantry Division had withdrawn its best officers first to stage a landing at Escravos to counter the secessionist invasion of uh, the Midwest in August 1967, and secondly, to uh, experienced officers and men were transferred from the Bonny Theatre to prepare for the landings in Sapele, Wari and Koko. Those who were left were mainly poorly trained and poorly led. It should also be noted that the relationship between Captain Soro and Lieutenant Colonel Adekule was not the best as they had conflicting personalities and styles of leadership and relations between sea and land commands in Bonny deteriorated while Commander Raw was on leave during the latter half 
of August in 1967. In late September 1967, when the federal side was expelling secessionist forces from the Midwest, Bonnie was attacked when left in the hands of the 7th Battalion of the 3rd Infantry Division, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Abubakar, while neighboring Peter's side only had a company commanded by Captain Bello. The federal side was vastly outnumbered by the secessionist attackers and in danger of being overwhelmed when naval headquarters was informed. NNS Nigeria was dispatched and it joined in the battle. Uh, it was joined in the battle by Ogoja. Soro recalled that some federal combatants had been literally pushed into the water, while Aduo had to refuse a request made by a federal troop commander to take him on board compelling the officer to stand and fight. The enemy was eventually driven back, largely through the firepower provided by naval warships. According to Soros' memoir, Lieutenant Colonel Abubakar admitted that the timely intervention of the Nigerian Navy had spared the Federal Army a defeat at the hands of the secessionist forces. Bonnie and Peter Syed were held on to, but the secessionists took over previous advanced positions held by the federal side, including Dawes Island, and they were able to construct a boom across the Bonnie River. Secessionist forces would not be removed from the approaches to Bonnie until January 1968, and Port Harcourt did not fall until May of that year. So this year is the chronology of amphibious assaults carried out by the Nigerian Navy during the Civil War, each of which slowly but assuredly began the encirclement of Biafra. And uh, this is a map that details the location of each of the landings uh, from the first one to the fifth and final one at Oran. And we may conclude um, that uh, the Nigerian Navy played a vital part in the defeat of the secessionist state through its amphibious operations and its mounting of a blockade. The Navy's capture, in combination with the 3rd Infantry Division of oil industry installations, ports and coastline, was an important component in securing the defeat of the armed forces of the secessionist state of Biafra. And here in the final photograph is the head of state awarding the Navy its first colours at a ceremony held at the naval base Apapa on Monday, October 21st, 1968. Gentlemen, I trust that you will ponder on these points and leave you to ruminate over what we have covered in the planning and execution of the body landing to draw lessons for the conduct of future amphibious operations undertaken by the Navy. It has been a pleasure delivering this lecture, which I hope has made a small contribution to enrichment of the corporate memory of the Nigerian Navy. Thank you. <laughs>